strong faith in the relationship with Christ. Oops, I, I guess I'm coming home. There's something God-given about you, these. I mean, you, you're you creative, you know what I mean. And have the cow swing its nice manure tail, and it goes around your head, and then right across your face. It's just a wonderful way to wake up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll miss this blueberry bush when you move. The prospect of a big move out of state has me in a sentimental mood. In this video, I'm going to explore my roots. It's a good chance for me to spend a little time with family too. My cousin Angie and her son Gus are visiting from Texas. We, along with my dad, are going to go on a road trip to Harrisburg and Eugene to see where my dad grew up. On another day, I'll probably take a trip with my mom to Dallas, Monmouth, and Salem. This video is a real treasure to me. Dad has always liked sharing his stories. It's good to preserve a few of them on video. This is homesteading related because mostly we're talking about generations of yesteryear when our family was farming in Harrisburg, Oregon. The road trip was an all-day one, so I couldn't just turn the camera on and let it go. I had to anticipate when one of Dad's stories was coming. Like most people would be, Dad can get self-conscious with a camera pointed at him. So I surreptitiously kept the camera in my lap, only occasionally turning it on, so he wouldn't necessarily know when I was recording. Apologies in advance for some of the video framing. The home place that was built in about 1915, and Dad uh, and his brothers and sisters lived there, but Dad was, uh, the, the, now there's a grove of trees in the house, or excuse me, where the old house where Dad was actually born in. And I'll show you where that was. Um, but the whole family, uh, and, and yet Edgar Grimes' family, which is Bruce, Roy, Malin, Edna, and Lee, they all grew up there. You'll find this really interesting. This is just kind of how people used to work together in the first place. When you go back to, like Dad graduated, so 15, 19, so let's say 1930s, most men only went through the eighth grade. Uh -huh. And Dad and her brothers and sisters and everything all went through college, except Elmer at the, at the very end, because he just wanted to be a farmer. But the way you had to do that in order to, like, oh, plus their father uh, bled to death from um, having his tonsils taken out. And so the boys and uh, uh, Amelia had to run the farm. Dad didn't get into it very much. Eros, sit, sit. Good dog, you just be quiet. Dad didn't get into it very much, and I should have asked him more about it while we were in the car. Eros, stop squeaking. Sit, stay, good dog. That tonsil story needs a little more explanation. Dad didn't get into it very much. I should have asked him more about it while we were in the car. It was a sad story. It was a sad chapter in our family history. Imagine my grandfather losing his dad way too early and then having to keep the farm going with just his mom and his brothers. Harrisburg was and still is a very small town. Dr. Clark, who did the dental work, had a grandson, Larry Coate, who married my dad's sister, Josiel. So, his grandfather killed her grandfather. Well, so dad didn't start college for two or three years after high school because he worked the farm while Lloyd and Edgar was in school. And so then, then they came back to some farming after some service. And then as he, Randall was in school and then dad went to school. So dad, they all, but, so, but anyway, each brother help each other get through college. Yeah, yeah. To complete college, I guess, you know, the, the cost of it, I mean. 
guess I was telling your mom a story about Papa John that when you had your own, you'd have a cow for your own milk and stuff. So every morning, he'd milk the cow about 5.30 in the morning. He'd milk the cow about 6 o'clock at night. And Dad was telling the story one time I'll never forget. He says, there's nothing like waking up in the morning, having your head against the you know, warm body of the cow, milking the cow, and have the cow swing its nice manure tail. And it goes around your head and then right across your face. This is a wonderful way to wake up. <laughs> <laughs> so how many animals did you guys have when you were growing up on the farm when you were little? Well, I mean, you know, who knows? It was like 30 or 40 chickens and a couple of cows and, you know, about four horses. And, and uh, you know, what else? I'm not, I don't know if we ever had a sheep. I don't think any of us like you know, lamb at that time. But... Uh, as far as accessible to us and neighbors and stuff, you could you could have about anything you want or trade, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. I'm trying to think if we had anything unusual. No llamas back then. No, no. We always had dogs and cats because at that time, you know, they didn't have spading or anything like that. Here's a horrible story to tell you, Gus, about what a Papa John's duties that he absolutely hated. So you guys seem to have kittens and, and puppies. I mean, that's just kind of the way the world was. But the farmer had to take care of, I mean, how many dogs do you need? You know, a couple, that's about it. But dad said it just killed him. Anyway, so you'd, you'd gather the puppies and or the kittens in a, in a um, burlap sack, tie it, go down to the river, drop it over, and he couldn't. He wouldn't allow himself to hear the splash. Papa John did tell me this story himself one time. To me, it's very poignant. In my mind's eye, I can see him as a young boy struggling with this task that he had to do, trying to find a way to live with himself after having done it. I don't care what day and age you lived in. Some human reactions are just human reactions. Papa John told me he had only ever heard that splash once. After that, he covered his ears so he couldn't hear what he had just done. That older generation, the things they had to do, first of all, feeding your own family, let alone keep five or six dogs and six or seven cats in life. Yeah. I mean, you want to start eating the dogs and cats? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I mean, just, um, no, I, don't know. I don't think you got too close to your animals back then for such a purpose. You just couldn't allow yourself to be attached. Well, you know, I think you, you could get... You, well, here... Okay, people are people. I think it would affect them here, back then, too, but... Here's a here's a good example. Now, we never had sheep, but it was not uncommon that you'd be working on a, a sheep dog or whatever, and it just didn't work out. So you just shot it and, and you, while you're working on another dog. I mean, it's just, you, you, we, you might think it's barbaric today, but how, if, the further you go back, uh, you might say it's more barbaric, but here's the thing is, what else are you gonna do? Yeah. What is what is common sense answer? Practical decisions. Yeah, for the time, you know? That's why when people start going back how, how you know, somebody lived and this and that, we should, we should give this person, that person, that person, well, let's, let's gauge it by the time of, you know, at the time of life that they were in. So you want to tell the story about the, the hop king of Oregon? Well, I don't know if, at one time he had more acres, Clint Murphy had more acres of hops, but we're talking the 40s and 50s, something like that. No, yeah, he had, Clint he, Murphy was the father of Helen Grimes, right. my yeah. grandmother. Yep. And he was a uh, just a big time hop producer in the, the region. Yeah. He was yeah, he was known for quite a bit of the big region stuff. So. But he also had his own what we call processing what we call the hop picker. So and then we have the hop dryer. We'll show, we'll show that to you later about you know, where they dried the hops. But see all those all those vines have little blossoms on them well that's the hop blossom. And that's the one that they want is the blossom. So that's the main reason that we went on this road is just so you can see a hop field because you're not going to see hop fields down in Harrisburg anymore.
a lot of this video is about Clint Murphy, my great-grandfather on my grandma Helen's side. He was, by far, the most entrepreneurial member of our family. I'll let Dad tell most of the stories, but I did talk to Joe Seal, Dad's older sister, to get a little more information to share. Somewhere along the line, he had a movie theater in the Dalles. This was the silent era before the talkies came along. As I understand it, he lost that business because of some disagreement with a business partner who sold him out. Here's one detail that shows Clint's confidence in his big thinking. Twice he had homes jacked up and physically moved to a different property. I guess he just found the perfect house and wanted to find the perfect lot to set it on. During the Great Depression, a bank failed and its creditors foreclosed on his place. In the end, and this was well after the Great Depression, he went from the wealthiest man in town to its poorest. Family history has it that since Clint was forced to sell his hop empire to Blitz Weinhardt, which at the time really put Blitz Weinhardt on the map, our family could have been more like Blitz Weinhardt had things turned out differently. So growing up on the farm, were you glad to not have to do farm work or you miss it still? Well, I think one of the reasons that I do as much yard work and Hudson is, and then my summer jobs, I've worked for Sunset Farms. Mm -hmm. I think the whole thing has to do to be in touch with the earth. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, just to be outside, I mean, space. I mean, you know, that, uh, I probably could do it, but when I look back on it, out of, out of 78 years, at least 55 lived in, have lived in the country. And so I could, I guess, live in the city because I have done it. And I like the idea that, you know, nobody's right there. Mm -hmm. Living in a place where you have room yeah. and yeah. surrounded by and farm there's, country. There's, there's something, there's something God given about you, these. I mean, you, you're creative. You know what I mean. But yeah, and, and, and like I mentioned to you earlier, Mike and I, we said we probably would have been pretty good farmers working together, but we're sure glad we didn't become farmers. <laughs> just, you, too, just too much hard work? Or? Well, no, I think that, I mean, if, first of all, you better have a strong faith and a relationship with Christ because you're waiting, you know, you're, you're gam not gambling. You're hoping the right weather, you're hoping the right timing, you know, you're waiting on anything else. Very so, most you can't control. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Said, yeah, we're sure glad we're not farmers, but like I said earlier, you just can't take the country out of the void. I mean, it just, it's just, it's there. Gus, have you actually been on a ferry before then? I have. Um, oh, darn, I thought this might be a first. No one like this, though. It's like big ones. Oh, okay. This is, this this goes way back. It's kind of funny in this day and age where there was, you know, ferries just kind of common that the Canby Ferry and this is the Wheaton Ferry is the only ones I'm aware, uh -huh. you know, are still around. And I think it's more of a novelty because you know that they could put a bridge across here and probably save money in, you know, 20 uh -huh. years or so. But like, I found an excuse to go across it today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. I mean, maybe, maybe dad took him across the candy one, but he would have been a little tired. One day I was coming back and I had my GTO. And I, 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 I go across the ferry and I said, I, I don't think I could. I think I. Oh, spray up a little bit. I, yeah, the, my, my head, header pipes have been, been dragging and I don't think I want to do that. Yeah, something you go, don't get to do every day. No, I, in fact, I haven't got across that for years. Well, we moved here in 1953, so I guess that's about when we couldn't make it anymore in the hop business, and you know, Dad and Murphy didn't have any more money to, or, you know, to support two families. So Dad went. I don't know how. Honestly, I don't know how he got um, back, but I do know for a short period of time, Dad worked in a sawmill. Uh, while we lived in, in, in Harrisburg. Uh, I think it was called Clark Sawmill or something, Junction City. It was a short period of time. So in the meantime, but yeah, I, I don't know how he ended up 
all I know is that he became the county agent. Bean boy. And because I was very skilled with people, they put me over to the Mexicans. And I wanted to be over where all the girls were from Central, from Dallas, from Monmouth, you know? And I'm over with Hispanics. And I'm not like they liked it, but it was one of those deals. But wait, but this is but this is not my plan. <laughs> <laughs> that was because you were too good at, at what you were doing? I, well, I, I guess I was likable and social. I mean, you know, I mean, you, know, but I, uh, you were goofing off too much in the other crowd. They no, you over there. No, not at all. Okay, no, but, okay. In fact, yes, at Sunset Farms, it was real interesting. Glenn Hardman and, and Ron, um, one day Glenn came out, we put the bean field, and they came out and brought us a pop. And I drank my pop and went right back to work. Because, you know, I wanted to keep my dollar an hour job. And anyway, he said, well, come back here. I'm giving you a break. And I didn't even realize, you know, you, you, got, you got a break. You know, you, and, and, uh, but all, all I said, all I knew is I was making, at, you know, when we worked eight hours a day, I'd make it eight dollars. When we worked 10 hours, I'd make, you know, 10 dollars. I worked 60. But anyway, there was no way I was going to miss out on an hourly job because my picking skills just wasn't you know, up to that. So, anyway, I just never forget it. So, come back here. I'm going to give you a break. Like, we can have a break. This was when you were 13 or 14? 14, I think. Yeah. And so, I think what happens is that it was a time where families were more, you know, collected, if you want to call it. And, and then people started moving. Away. So, maybe it's just like there was so much. I mean, like, you know, I can, I'll show you where the Deedering place is and where the Bowers. I mean, there's six or seven Bowers. You know, Jess Bowers, Walt Bowers, Howard Bowers, you know, Ben Bowers. And and then there's Roy, and then there's Dean, and Paul, and, and then the Shuskoskis, and then the Malpuses. And, you know, we, these are the properties um, that people had. And I think that maybe, maybe it just feels like that was how life was for me. Um, you might say that cocoon or whatever you call it, but because it was all there. And I, I, I don't, I do not have an explanation for it, but anytime I'm having a chance to go down I-5, I'll kick over and take Peoria to go into Eugene. Just, I don't know, because of the feeling or, uh, and I've always, I love, um, I love because it really maybe hasn't changed so much. The Willamette's kind of on the on the right side of it, as you go down some ways and, and the, the road just kind of sweeps and, I don't know, just, it puts, it puts me someplace that I like. I don't have an answer, explanation for it. I go, it's, I guess I'm coming home. It's a feeling of community, yes, families. I think so, because there's, I mean, there's nobody there I really, really, really know anymore, mm -hmm. you know? But from when you were there, yeah. it felt like it was yeah. something special, whole small town Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I guess, here's the other thing, how about, both your grandparents were within a short drive. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, I mean, and then Norma, my grandma, I love, I love my grandma, Norma. And, uh, oh, I bet I did get with it here. Too many stories, not enough driving? <laughs> well, I didn't realize the road just yeah. feathered out. There's a little white church that Donnie Bain was the pastor, and that's where they got. Buried right there. Uh, here. Papa John and Helen got married there. Huh? Papa John and, and Helen. Yeah. yeah. When they got married the second time. Mm -hmm. Ryan, how would you like to just own all that? Yeah. yeah. It's like, you know, what would you do with it? It's like, you know, just. In a perfect world, I would have. You know, so you said that because I thought it'd be kind of neat to have a great big deal like this, and you'd be you know, like, say, you know, five or six people, all of homes, and you had a community center right in the middle. That's right. You know? So you have your own privacy, but if you want to go and sit in the community center and talk, you can. I mean, it's all, it's all a matter of, you know, people volunteering and helping out. But again, back in time, you would not have a problem if somebody, I'll take care of it. You know, nowadays, like, well, I don't know if I have time. I'm also busy. Oh, that's too much effort. I guess we're, because of everything that's happening, we're being forced back to wanting the olden days. You know what? I 
people. That's what it gave away. Without it being spoken, it was a community. The community functioned because the community functioned. If you got what I mean. Okay. People, just, people just stepped up. Got eight of them there. Seven of them. Farms have gotten bigger. Yep. Well, they have, you have to have a lot of acreage to make it. Uh, the first time, two, three hundred acres, so you can't make a living off that. Down there is Norma, which is a grandma that I really knew, and and then Clint. Well, Mike's little canister is just between the two of them. <laughs> I put it there special. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's get out and take a look. Sure. So this is my grandmother. From the Murphy family side of things. And dad comes out here to keep things trimmed and nicer looking. I, I, I mean, I have no idea, you know, where did he get his moxie or, you know. Business here, sense to acquire so much land for yeah. the hops. Yeah. Well, but here's the thing too. He took, he, uh, you know that picture I have we called the Teamsters? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So way back in uh, 1907 or something like that, he was running a team of horses making deliveries in Portland. Next thing, he's here, because mom was born here. Then he homesteads in Haver, Montana. I remember that story, and, yeah. And Ethel May is born in Haver. And it, I guess after five years, you'd own the property if you're in Clareville. They made it about three and a half or four years, whatever. Comes back, starts getting in the hop. I mean, how does a person that's a lot do of this? That's a lot of things. That? Mm -hmm. That's you know, a lot of things. I, I have no clue. I really have no clue. How do you do all those things? You know. Right. And 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 and, and guess what? You're not gonna. You can't fall back on anything. It's you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Anyway, I thought you'd get a kick out of just just seeing. The yeah. Place. But that I mean the the dates 18. 1883 to 1957. She was the one yeah. in Portland. Ethel? Yeah. Actually, really well known for her singing. Yes. Yeah. Silent movie. Ethel Murphy was Clint's first wife. She had really bad asthma and died in her 40s because of it. In her short life, though, she really made a good name for herself. Her health was the reason that they gave up trying to homestead in Montana. I guess the conditions back there were just so bad they had to come back to Oregon. Family history has it that at one point, Ethel Murphy was the highest paid singer in Portland. Years ago, I was talking with Arlie Holt, one of our regional historians, he told me that Ethel's music really was very well known and that for years and years during the holidays, the radio would always play her version of one of the Christmas classics. When Clint Murphy's hop business was going strong, he asked John Grimes, his son-in-law, to come back and help. Papa John was a good worker, he was family, and really he was a lot better with people than Clint was. It was actually Papa John who managed the day-to-day -day farming operations. Sometimes he wasn't too kind. He'd fire people all the time. Well, Dad actually went to business. Dad had to talk him to come back to work. On it. Oh, gee. <laughs> you, know, you know, somebody. Clint Murphy wasn't the best, uh, he best of the, bosses. I'm going to say not the best communicator. The fact is, I always remember, I was always kind of, I think, afraid of him. I, mean, I don't know why, because like, you know, he seems stern or whatever, I don't know. Again, he died in 1957, I think it was, and so I was a seventh grader. So my, my uh, perspective of him is, what, 14 years or 13 years? And of course, most of that be really even younger than that. It's, he seemed like a grouch. <laughs> I'm not sure I actually got it on camera, Dad. Can you tell the story again about the uh the hop blight that uh, affected uh, Clint Murphy? Well, what happened, I, well, actually, let's say, I'm going to be guessing, 
the crop of 1950, 51, 52, three years, the hot blossoms got what they call mildew, and it, it made the blossom rot. So it was worth zero. So after three years, which farmer can handle you know, three years? Now, my grandfather could kind of hold on, but there was no more you know, income for a second. If we're, well, John Lawrence and his family are in our family. So, you know, dad fell back on his education, went back into uh, county agent work. But that was after uh, working at a sawmill for I don't know how many months until that worked out. So the way that dad told me the story is, I mean, it's weird, when, like how you remember certain things. Yeah. He had said to me that grandpa had bought new machinery for the farm and red spider hit. And maybe that's what you're talking about, Pat, that, that particular... I think Related I, to whatever blight it was, maybe? So it was a heavy investment that then was followed by three years of losses. So Right, and that's when the bank came in and like said, you can't afford the machinery that you bought. Oh. That goes together. Yeah. That could be, yeah. So sad. The that place, though, as I feel like, it had the most beautiful house with a balcony on it and everything. It was just gorgeous. And like, like I said earlier, that when he had it almost paid for it, that the bank failed. So that might be saying, who knows during the depression, I, I can't say when. So the bank owned the paper on the property and basically said, thank you very much. We own it, get off our, get off our land. Well, I don't think that the average American is aware of how in trouble we are as a country with the amount of farmers losing their farm. I, I did a course on this um, for counseling agriculture people, yeah. and uh, the, you know the suicide rate is high, the disability rate is high, and yeah. then you've got you people who are used to being self-reliant. Yes, and these been, this land has been in their family for unprepared of to years. deal with. Yeah, it can be a real blow. So you've got you know you've got China you know buying up some of the and Bill Gates buying up some of the farmland. You've got Ukraine not giving us our fertilizer, and so people are going to start folding left and right, which is why I think what you're doing is so fascinating and important that I think individual families are going to have to start going back to their own farming, you know, even if it's just a garden and some chickens, to be able to take care of themselves in the coming years. I've got more and even better dad stories coming up in the next video. Thanks for watching.